Thank you. Well, as we heard in the introduction, my take on the conference theme of look deeper is that we should look deeper at ourselves. And the way I want to do this as a computer scientist, of course, is to get more data about that to figure it out. And I hope by the end of the talk, you'll be able to find ways of getting data about yourself and maybe answer this question. Am I normal? But before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So as you heard in the introduction, my name is Blaine Price. I live and work in the UK at the Open University. I'm 49 years old. I guess that makes me middle-aged. Um, I am about 177 centimeters tall, um, 81 kilos, so overweight. Um, you can read the other dimensions there from my 3D body scan. Uh, if we look at my pulse oximeter, uh, so my pulse is about 73 or so, blood oxygen of 99%, which is quite healthy. But if you look at my heart rate and how it's varying, you can see the, uh, the RR number there. That's the interval between my heartbeats. The statistical analysis of that shows a very low variability, which means I'm under some kind of stress for some reason. <laughs> if we look at this, you can see the, that I slept for seven hours and 37 minutes last night um, with an average heart rate of 52 beats per minute, according to the sensor that is underneath my mattress. And it looks like from that, I went into about four phases of deep sleep overnight. But if we look at the electroencephalograph headband that I wore, we can see that I had four distinct phases of REM sleep or dreaming, lasting about three hours. That's quite good, actually. And about an hour and a half of deep sleep, also quite good. I'm quite pleased with that. Uh, in the last week, I walked about 36,000 steps uh, while running. I did about 17,000 steps. That equates to about 27 kilometers of walking and 16 kilometers of running. Um, I was recorded as cycling about 10 kilometers that week. And uh, I also spent about three hours in some form of motorized transport. One of those was my electric car, uh, which went about 1,000 miles in the last month. It uh, was a very efficient four miles per kilowatt hour. And according to the graph, I did about 20 miles a day on most days, except for the second of the month, where I seem to have done a very long journey. In my home, uh, my home consumed about 42 kilowatt hours of electricity, but 23% of that came from my solar panels, so I only had to import uh, uh, the remaining 77% from the grid. I generated an excess of 11 kilowatt hours, which we sent back to the grid. My life logging camera here, took about 3,000 photos last week, um, recording about 144 unique faces over that time period. And the software on my computer uh, tells me that Wednesday of last week was my most productive day, and that my average productivity for the week was about 53%, which for me is about average. So anyway, now that you know all this, can you tell me if I'm normal? <laughs> well, my family and my colleagues don't think so. But uh, kidding aside, we could go and look at the, uh, the statistics for northern European middle-aged males for any of those characteristics and see where I am on the normal curve. But that's not really the interesting question. The interesting question is, why did I go to the trouble of collecting all of that data? It's crazy. Well, the answer is that I didn't go to the trouble of collecting all of that data. It was collected automatically for me. You see, we now have reached this technology tipping point where the sensors that you need to collect all of those things are so cheap and so ubiquitous, people are building them into everything around us, into our phones, our computers, our cars, our homes, everywhere. And most of them, many of them anyway, are connected to the internet. So you can, you can get by, you can get lots of this inf information without spending a lot of money. Now, if you ask Apple or Google or Microsoft or many of the other manufacturers of the smartwatches and the fitness bands, they would quite prefer to you to spend hundreds of dollars or euros on a gadget. But I can tell you that you don't need to. And that even if you do, you'll get some wonderful data, just like I've done there, and a very deep insight, perhaps, of how you are at this particular moment. But typically, people, when they buy a gadget, use it for a few weeks, forget about it, and after about three weeks, it ends up in the back of a drawer. And 
The fact is, most of you are already carrying most of the sensors you need to do this sort of thing. But what, the, uh, what we need to do is take advantage of the technology we have around us, because we can collect the data automatically and continuously. And then we can take advantage of the real reason that computers were created for us. They were created to take the drudgery out of calculating things, tabulating things, and recording things. So I'm sure many of you have, have, uh, have done this, bought this kind of app or gadget and left it in a drawer, so you'll know what I mean. The, the real power, though, of using this technology over a longer period of time is to get a kind of a history. Because people are very poor at noticing very small changes that happen over long periods of time. So, if you put on, say, 30 grams of weight every day, so the weight of an espresso, you wouldn't notice. Your family wouldn't notice. After a year, you'd be obese. And probably along the way, you'd eventually notice, but probably by the time it's, by the time it's too late. So, if you had some kind of electronic monitor, a doctor, that was constantly monitoring you and looking at the trends, you might be able to catch these things before they got serious. Let me give you an example from my own data. Okay, so for the past four years, I've had some kind of activity monitor, either one of these little wireless things you can clip to yourself, or my phone, which records my activity level. And uh, this is a graph showing my average daily step count over the last four-year period. So, without looking at the dates at the bottom, those of you who, uh, I'd like you, all, you to take a guess, actually, as to what the dips in the graph correspond to, keeping in mind that I live on a big island in the North Atlantic. Okay, so those of you who are from Cyprus won't be able to guess this. Those of you who've lived in Northern Europe for any length of time will know that those are winters on the graph. Everyone in Northern Europe gets less active. And in my case, I put on weight due to that. Many other people do, too. You could have, I could put the weight on there to show you that happens. But um, inactivity in winter also is an indication of many other things, including depression. Many people get winter depression. And the technology we have around us can help predict this, detect it, and head it off before it happens. Your phone can measure how active you are and, and spot the trend in, in changing. It can also tell things like how much time you're spending around other people. Your phone has a radio in it. Most other people carry a phone. They have radios. Your phone can tell when it's around other people. So if it finds you starting to get a little more socially isolated, a little less active, it can intervene or advise someone to intervene to head off serious depression or serious weight gain in my case. So you can get a deeper insight into yourself. You can look deeper by comparing yourself with yourself over time and see how normal you are compared to your past self. But what about comparing yourself with other people? So I'd like you to meet three people who participated in a study we ran last year at the Open University. These ladies all have the same kind of job. It's one you'll recognize. It involves sitting in front of a desk, answering email, going to meetings, and writing reports. OK? I think most of us can identify. So first, we have Kathy. She's in her 40s. She's a uh, mother of teenage children, a busy mother. And for exercise, she goes to this military-style boot camp training twice a week. This is where you pay someone to yell at you like a drill sergeant and do exercise. I find it foreign as well. OK. Anyway, Celia, she's in her 50s. Uh, she doesn't have kids at home, uh, but she does ballroom dancing and goes to the gym for her exercise. And then finally, we've got Pam. She's in her 60s. Uh, she, her kids are all grown up, so she's got no one at home, but she does have a dog. Uh, that needs walking, so that's her exercise in the day. So we gave these ladies these activity monitors, we put apps on their phones, monitoring their sleep, their activity, and so on. And at the beginning of the study, we asked them to predict amongst themselves, they're all friends, how they would fare in terms of which would be the most and least active. And for them, it was an easy answer. They all, they all agreed. So they all agreed that Kathy, the youngest one, with her boot camp training, would be the most active. Celia, the next oldest, would be second and Pam third with just walking the dog. In fact, the actual outcome was a bit different. So what we had, actually, was this. Kathy, the boot camp lady, got, on many days, less than 4,000 steps. Now, that's actually hard to do. Even for us who are chained to desks, it's hard to do. It's, it's very unusual. Pam was quite healthy up there at 8,000, Celia 11,000. But luckily, because we gave them lots of, uh, lots of apps on their phone that monitored them, we could tell why this happened. We analyzed it. So Kathy had a very busy lifestyle with the teenage children and so on, but she spent most of her time either at her desk, 
sitting in her car or sitting at home. When she was running around with the kids, she was actually just ferrying them in the car, and most of her steps accounted from walking from the car to the desk, back to her car, car in the front door of the house. Um, Pam did much better because she had regular daily exercise that was forced on her. Every single day, the dog needed to be walked. And in all my studies, dog walkers really do well. Um, she also, at lunchtime, didn't sit at her desk. At lunchtime, she would have a quick lunch and then go for a walk for an hour whereas Kathy ate her lunch at her desk and worked through her lunch hour. And then Celia there with her gym uh, did the best because she was doing it consistently and often, and actually she was a very competitive person, so she actually was looking at the numbers and trying to get ahead, so that's a bit different. Um, they also got a few more insights um, about their sleep, for example, the other thing we monitored. So um, Kathy, she had a very regimented bedtime every day. I mean, at the end of the day, you could see her data almost to the minute. She went to bed at the same time every day, woke up at the same time every morning. I don't know no one else who does that. Pam. Pam sleeps about nine hours every night, which was very rare, but it worked for her. And then Celia had an average with the rest of us around seven and a half, which was quite, quite normal. Um, the other insight they got was um, Celia um, used the headband monitoring technology and looked at her sleep more deeply and found that she got very little deep sleep compared to the others. But when she had red wine, that really caused her deep sleep to nosedive. And when she reflected afterwards, she was, uh, even one glass of wine did it, it would, it would really affect negatively on her life. So she learned that red wine is a no-no, um, especially in the evenings. So now looking deeper into yourself goes beyond just measuring the data over time or comparing yourself with others or, or using some sort of gadget. Um, because there are only so many things that are in your power to change. For example, if as a child you aspired to be a professional basketball player and both of your parents were below average height, you'd probably be counseled not to go down that career route. Okay? Unfortunately, most of our genetic makeup is not as visible to us as our height is, so we can't easily figure out what works and what doesn't. But we've now come to a point where for about $100, you can have a personal genome test and get a readout of all the, uh, the SNPs in your, or many of the SNPs in your genome. And this means that you can find out if you're more or less susceptible to certain diseases or certain drugs, or more importantly, which behavioral and physiological changes are more likely to work for you. So most of us have a gene which codes for getting pleasure from food. We enjoy going out for a meal. That's pretty average. Most of us, some of us don't. Some people don't have that gene, and you know, it's just refueling. Lucky them. Um, <laughs> so most of us have the gene which, um, which uh, codes for only losing weight when you do very high energy exercise. So people with this gene, if they um, if they uh, go on a diet and don't also use very high energy exercise during the diet, they can gain weight on a diet. I've known several people to do this. And then some people will get uh, fat very, very quickly on a high fat diet. They're very sensitive to that sort of thing. So knowing what genetic hand you've been dealt, combined with the data that you get from whatever you're using to measure, means you can take the best, the most effective measures possible to make any change you would like to. So I've told you about this brave new world of this technology and these apps and free and ubiquitous and everywhere that are going to help you change your life. But the first thing you should probably be asking yourself now is what's the catch? Because of course there is one. Nothing is free, is it? So one of the catches that you get when you buy, say, one of the gadgets that measures something for you is the manufacturer might lock you into their ecosystem they might require you to only get at your data through their portal and analyze it in the ways that they would like you to analyze it. Which means that if you want to combine it with some of the other data, say the data about your behavior or your work on your computer or something else, you're stuffed. So another way that you can, you can lose out on this, on this free and ubiquitous self-quantifying is when you have apps that do give you access to your data, but they also insist that they have access to and they sell the data onward to marketing people or perhaps use it in ways that you didn't really intend. And finally, we have the, the old risk of data leakage, of data that you collect and maybe keep for yourself, but leaks out because the website has an insecure password or some other way. And then you have many risks of unforeseen 
um, future use of your data. So you do your genome test, and then you find years later that you can't get life insurance or health insurance because your insurer sees you have a 2% higher risk of some deadly disease. Or you can imagine a situation where the state healthcare system is trying to save money. So they require you to keep up a certain activity level if you're going to have access to the state health care. Okay? So most of the data that you collect and most of the methods that we use for analyzing the data um, at the Open University are designed to give you control of your data. Uh, it's very important to think of data as your own property, just as your real property is your property, because you should have complete control over what happens to it. You could choose to give your data away to Google or Facebook, or you could choose to sell it to them and make your own money from it and monetize your own data. You could choose to donate your data to, say, the national health system for research purposes, or keep it to yourself in another, in, in another ecosystem so that you can share it with different providers who you pay to analyze your data and combine it and give you insights about your life. So most of our work is involved in helping, giving people tools that will help them achieve that goal. So I've just given you this very quick overview of some of the powerful tools you can use. And many people often say to me, Blaine, you're a geek. There's no way that normal people are going to be able to use this stuff. So I'll give you two examples where you can. This is uh, an app available on the two major smartphone platforms. It's called Moves. And you can just install it and forget it. It will then keep a minute-by-minute -minute diary of where you are and what you've been doing how far uh, it'll, you can actually click on links there and see the map of where you've gone. You can uh, also have a complete history of how, how far you've walked or run, how much exercise you've had, and so on. So that's one method. I would caution you with this one, however. It was recently bought by Facebook, so you may want to read the privacy policy first. Uh, another one is, uh, this is called Rescue Time. Uh, there are many others as well besides the ones I've mentioned. This one uh, installs in your computer, uh, or you can get a plugin in your web browser, and it monitors what you're doing on your computer uh, and lets you see when you're perhaps getting distracted, going off to read Facebook when you should be writing your report, and you know, it can prompt you or interrupt you as you configure it and give you a report on how productive you are. So what I would challenge you to do is go away, find some app, perfect, check the privacy policy first, Get some app that's free. Start recording data about yourself, because you need to have a history. Even if you think you aren't going to be interested in this technology now, having a history of all of your data means when you are interested later, you'll be able to go back and look at it. So just remember to keep the data in your hands, and you'll be able to look deeper at yourself. Thank you very much.